Now, guys, I have to tell you, I have not seen this woman in a while. It's because she abandoned us all and moved to Silicon Valley. But this is a very, very important person to me personally, because I had never worked a day in life, in, a day of my life in tech until uh, Maeve Nisi, who was the chairperson of the Irish Internet Association at the time, many moons ago, entrusted me with being its CEO for seven years. So uh, I am always indebted to her for that. She was a great chairperson, a great role model and mentor to me in that time. Uh, I have no doubt you are going to get a huge amount from listening to her in this session. She is a serial entrepreneur. And, uh, and actually, interesting enough, we have got a lot of former media and press people on the lineup today. So uh, that, that's, I think, where Maeve started some of her career, but has done so many other things, has founded two agencies. Um, I have worked with them absolutely super and, and is now you know, gone hardcore into tech. Uh, with Cloud KPI, which is her current venture, and I say current because she's always on the move. Maeve needs to see everybody. Maeve, thank you so much. So I'm not going anywhere, by the way. I'm not on the move because I have to make money now. <laughs> okay, so can you hear me? Yeah. So I think what it's like to be an entrepreneur is often just like this, okay? It's like a roller coaster. And people say to you, you know, it's a roller coaster. What they don't really realize is that a lot of the time you're just on the edge of it all falling apart, okay? But then you grab on tight and you keep going. Um, and I remember uh, when I was talking to this Silicon Valley entrepreneur about the fact that it's ups and downs, ups and downs. One day you think you're an absolute winner and the next day you feel like it's all gonna fall apart. Um, and that's hard to cope with. And what it really is hard to cope with is the emotions. It's not really the facts, it's the feelings that it isn't gonna work, the business isn't gonna happen for you. Um, and he said, yes, it is hard, but the hard part is they're all happening on the same day. So it's a big, huge, cram full time of so many things changing, so many ups and so many downs. Um, but, you know, we pretend everything's fine. That's the face of us pretending everything's fine. So you're working really hard underneath, your, your feet are flapping as quick as you possibly can. Um, but in fact, it's not always fine. But then you have the days where everything is just fantastic. And then you realize that you've got an idea you and your founder have got an idea and people are paying for it. And that's when it's really, really worth it because there's nothing better than it being your idea and people believe they need it and they're willing to pay for it. So in terms of my background, I don't come from um, a family that ran their own business, neither did their parents. But I think I did learn things from watching my parents um, and particularly my father because he was running a business um, and he took some big, brave decisions as part of that. And so I learned from my parents, from my father certainly to be brave, and for my mother, certainly, that it's a good thing not to always be like everybody else. Um, and so, you know, now today we're so used to people like LinkedIn and Google and Facebook having their headquarters for Europe here in, in, in Dublin or in Ireland. Uh, but in the 60s, that was happening as well. And my father, as a young engineer, uh, joined an American company in Shannon, when Shannon Development had a whole heap of American companies setting up. And then he kept doing that. And then by the time the 1980s came along, he got a chance to go and head up an American company and move to the States. So that would have been in the 80s. Um, and we all went lock, stock and barrel as a family. And I absolutely loved America. I loved the feeling of business there, the speed of change. So I always had in the back of my head that I get a chance to go back and do that. But, you know, I didn't exactly follow the rest of my family in terms of what they studied in college. I didn't do the kind of engineering, medicine um, or law. Instead, I did exactly the right subject that you should do if you want to be a tech entrepreneur. And I studied history of art and philosophy. And you're probably thinking, why is it so important to be able to recognize a Renoir at 50 paces or to know that I think, therefore I am, which is what history of art and philosophy are all about. But in fact, I believe that if you have too structured a career, which a lot of the careers in engineering, and particularly medicine and law, are going to give you, it means that you don't early on have to make choices about where you're going. Um, and if you do a broad general degree, from the word go, you're having to make decisions and you begin to realize to trust those decisions um, because they're gonna bring you somewhere. So just to give you a very brief background, um, when I finished college, I did a year traveling, which I loved. Then I came back and there was no jobs in Ireland and actually I didn't want to stay here anyway. It was quite doomy and gloomy. So I thought I'm gonna go off to London and find myself a job. And when I went to London, it was hard to get jobs, but I found this publishing company that loved graduates. And what they did is they take a big intake in and they teach you so much. Every single day you had training. And that training was all about selling. So I learned to sell, I learned to negotiate, 
I learned about body language, I learned about buyer psychology, I learned about presentations. And that really stuck by me the whole way through and allowed me when I had my first child to move back to Ireland um, and get a job in the Tribune. So I don't know if you guys know Vincent Brown, I hope you do. Um, but he, he was setting up a new newspaper as part of the Tribune called the Dublin Tribune. Um, and my boss, Barbara Nugent, basically coached me along to build up the commercial side of that newspaper. But what I got to do, which you, if you get a chance to do, do before you become an entrepreneur, is I got to learn how to take a concept and an idea from just that into an actual living, breathing business on somebody else's time and money, because it wasn't my money. And it was a brilliant, absor absorbing, exciting time. I just absolutely loved it. And then I stayed in publishing uh, you know, for, for quite a while, 10 years, I'd say, and eventually ended up CEO of a magazine publishers. Um, and during that time, we were starting to buy in lots of different magazines to build a group. And one of them was a magazine called .ie, and an awards called the Golden Spider Awards, which some of you might know. Um, and I got to work with that team, and I got so excited. I could see this is where the future is. I really felt publishing was dead. Um, that now it's going to be all online, and that in 1998, now is the time to, to make some good decisions. So I went to the board and I said, let's move you know, lots of titles online, let's do this, and I had all sorts of ideas. And basically, I got a blank wall. You know, they, they really weren't ready for it at that time, they weren't interested in what I was talking about. So that's when I became an entrepreneur. So you can see it was completely by accident. I was accidental entrepreneur. I just got really frustrated because I thought, you know, this is where the future is, I want to be part of it. I don't, want to, I don't think the publishers are going to do it, and that's all my skills, so what am I going to do now? So I just had my third child, which wasn't a very good time to start a business. Uh, it was also 2000, which is the dot bomb. But I think a recession is a good time to start a business because you're quietly building it up, and then by the time things start to pick up in the economy, you're ready for it. So I always get lucky. I got lucky again because what happened then was I got a contract with AIR, who had just um, invested in a content strategy company, a content company, called Rondo Mondo. Um, and they need somebody to help them with their advertising network to figure out how to do ads online. And I did that job for six months, but I also got access to Gartner, which I hope you guys know. And I literally sat down every night when I finished my job and I read whatever I could get my hands on Gartner to try and understand what was going on in digital content and marketing. And then another lucky thing is I met Aileen O'Toole, who was a former co-founder of the Sunday Business Post. And we put our heads together and we started a digital marketing company. Um, which was very exciting. And then subsequently, I set up Elucidate, and for 10 years, I ran Elucidate, which was a digital marketing agency, and we had brilliant clients, brilliant, brilliant time, and th that went on for 10 years. But, I mean, the whole thing is that you're always reinventing yourselves, and, and you know, you're going to find that in your life, and everybody does, that you, you, know, you go along, you have a particular direction you're going in, you get a certain level of knowledge, and then things start to change. Um, and I think because online hasn't just changed you know, in terms of business, it's changed every aspect of our lives. We're always going to have to keep reinventing ourselves because jobs will change, the world around us will change, and it's a good thing to learn that earlier on. But, you know, when, when people talk about success, and certainly until you actually try and be successful, you think it's a straight line, that if I have a good enough idea that people want, I'll go out, I'll show it to them, they'll buy it, and everything will go, you know, from A to B, clearly. But every single time I've tried to do something that I think is a brilliant product or idea, when I've brought it out to the customers, they always send me back. So basically, I have to learn to listen. And I think early selling and early training taught me, if you listen to the customer, go back with their ideas, they'll actually give you a blueprint for success. You just have to get your ego out of the way and just listen to what's going on around you, and it'll help you enormously. So then, of course, we're trundling along, Elucidate's growing really fast, we're getting excited about the business, and then the recession hits. So it was a big, big impact, and you know this, I'm sure you've had enough information about the recession. But for us, we were extremely lucky once again because we had clients who liked us a lot and still loved us, they still had some budget, and we also had quite a lot of government business. So that kept us alive during the worst of the recession. But we said, we're never going to get ourselves back in that situation again. So what mistake we'd made was, we didn't have any business outside of Ireland. We pretty much had all our eggs in a couple of baskets. We had a couple of huge clients, and we knew that the next time, at bad times hit, we're not going to survive. We're not going to be so lucky. So we've got to try and expand the business and get outside of Ireland, and we've got to go international with that. So one of the things I do, and I did when I was um, running Elucidate, 
was I used to go and do some lecturing on digital marketing and strategy for the Irish Times, the Irish Internet Association and the Digital Marketing Institute. And every single time I'd start a session, I'd say, how many people in this room, remember it's digital marketing, are targeting international markets? And of all the people, we only ever got 20% putting their hands up. And there's no way you can survive and grow a big business if you stick on this island. It's a fantastic place to be, but we're part of a global economy. So I always say, you know, get off the island, do stuff and think big. So, you know, with in mind our whole feeling that we're not going to kind of restrict ourselves, we started to look and try and see, could we expand Elucidate initially into the UK market? Um, and so we went to the UK, we started talking to um, the market over there. We used Enterprise Ireland to help us enter the market. But what we discovered really fast was that the shortage of skills for really deep knowledge around digital marketing was just as short in the UK as it was in Ireland. So it wasn't going to work for us to try and expand the services business. So we started trying to find a product that would allow us to expand the business. So to help me you know, and our team figure out, well, what can we do as a product rather than a service? Where's our core skills? I knew that I had to get out of just my own sphere and I had to start talking to other people who had more knowledge than I had. And there's an organization called Going for Growth that's particularly uh, useful whoop, for uh, women into, who want to expand their business. So I started talking to them. I had an amazing mentor called Monica Flood. And she helped me kind of build, and all the other founders as well, ideas around what we were going to do. And outcomes of that was a company called Market Finder. And what Market Finder was, was a business that went into things like banks and insurance companies and evaluated how successful they were online and showed them how they could make more money online. Okay, so it sounds like a good idea, right? It was a good idea. We got really good customers. KBC bought the product very early on, and we thought this is really going places. But when we tried to sell it into the UK market and, and, and really expand and get traction with customers, we realized that the banks and the insurance companies that we were targeting had much bigger fires to fight than what we were offering. You know, they really had problems, and that we were not going to be the fire hose to solve the problems that they were trying to solve. So we ended up being what's called a nice to have instead of a really, really need to have. So we were like a vitamin rather than a painkiller. And you know, when you know that, you say, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to pull back in and maybe we're not going to expand as fast as we thought. And maybe I'll use this solution along with my consultancy and, and slowly build a business, slowly, slowly, which you know, probably would have worked. But it would have taken a long time. And while that was happening, luckily enough, I met somebody else who was very similar to me who had also built a business over years. She was an entrepreneur, her name was Brenda Jordan. And she'd built a really strong accountancy firm and she'd built a product that allowed small businesses to automatically see their financial metrics. But she was suffering exactly the same thing as me, which was, I've got a great product, but it's not something people really have to have, it's a nice to have. So what we did is we joined forces together and we decided that the two of us were much stronger than one. We'd both been looking at the US market We'd both been looking at a sector of the market called software as a service, which you probably know like SurveyMonkey, Constant Contact. And we said that market is really struggling with getting insight to know what's going on in their businesses and we can solve that between us. So we joined forces and that's really the beginning of, of Cloud KPI, which is the business I'm in now. So about 18 months ago, we said, okay, where are all of these businesses? Where are these software as a service businesses? and they're all in Silicon Valley. They're in Silicon Valley and they're in North America. So how do we get ourselves over there? So we got a small amount of investment. We raised about 150,000 and we used that to get out to the States and Enterprise Ireland brought us to, on a program called Access Silicon Valley that allowed us to meet lots and lots of different potential customers, to talk to investors, to meet advisors. And really quickly we could see that there was a massive opportunity for our business over in the States. Um, and so, about eight months ago, we started, we had our product designed specifically for that market and we started really pushing in the US market. Um, and that worked very well for us, but I learned so much in it. And the only way to really do the states, if you're trying to get in as a business, is you've got to build an ecosystem around you. And so, you know, if you don't have that ecosystem, it's going to take you ages to get in front of the right customers, it's going to take you an awful long time to raise money. Um, and that ecosystem, you have to find out where that ecosystem is. And basically, the way we did it was through accelerator groups. So I don't know if you've heard about these groups, but basically, they've got them here in Ireland. They take a small uh, percentage equity in your business, and in exchange for that, they get you in front of customers, they get you in front of investors, they give you advisors, they give you mentors. So it changed our whole landscape. We did in about three months what would take us about 12 months because of those accelerators. 
Um, and one of them is called Plug and Play. Um, and we want to play some Plug and Play in April of last year. Plug and Play is the biggest accelerator in Silicon Valley. And then in September, we also want to place on the Women's Startup Lab. Uh, we've got one place out of 10 from 350 applications. So, you know, suddenly we have a, an entire group around us helping us. Um, but in Silicon Valley, you know, you can reach out, like Joe was saying, and build external advisors and helpers to help us two co-founders and our development team back in Ireland really get faster and better at what you do. Um, and the, the advisors, what they do is they come on board to be an advisor to you. You see them maybe once, twice a week. You plan out what you need their help with, whether it be technical help, sales help, whatever it happens to be that you need at the time, and ex in exchange for a very small amount of equity in the company. So that equity could be 0.25%, so we're not talking about a big amount. But the whole culture out there is to help startups. The whole culture is to get you moving fast. And if you tap into that, you can go really fast with very little money, but a lot of really good ideas and good help. So, you know, plug and play, I'm just telling you a little quick story about plug and play. Plug and play came out of a guy who in the 80s was in Iran and fled Iran and had hardly, you know, he'd, he'd lost all his money. And he started by uh, buying and selling property. And when he was buying and selling that property, over time he started to do really well. And he started to sublet one of his big buildings to different technology companies. And what he discovered was that as the recession, the dot bomb started to come towards him, he started really worrying about those companies being able to meet their rent. So he started talking to those companies to try and find out what are they actually doing? What are they building? What are they doing? And he liked a couple of them and he said to them, I'll tell you what, you give me equity, I'll reduce your rent which is a really sensible thing to do, isn't it? You're, you know, you're kind of mitigating against losses. But two of those companies turned out to be Dropbox and PayPal. So he made a lot of money. And of course, that started the whole accelerator model. Um, and so to be in that environment with all of those people is incredible because they tap you into so much um, and it's been amazing. Okay, so I don't know if anybody said it, but entrepreneurs like me and other people, that we often get it wrong, right? And I know people say failure is the best way to learn, but it actually is the best way to learn. But I thought I'd pluck out a few things that really resonated with me that could be useful to you. So I would say about 50% of entrepreneurs who I've met, and, and I've been in this situation before, make a mistake of not listening to their customers, okay? So they get so passionate and so in love, or maybe even arrogant, that they won't listen to what the customers are telling them. So that's a huge disaster. You've got to listen. That doesn't mean you let go of your idea, but you've got to mold it around what the market's looking for. And if they don't want it at all, you have to get over it, right? The other part is discounting. You know, if you start dropping your price too early, it's really hard to build it back up again. So don't be desperate. Try and hold out in terms of the pricing. Um, and then, of course, finding the right buyer. So just any old customer, sometimes when you're desperate like we are and you're bootstrapping and you want cash in, you know, you're, you tend to do that. But if you can identify who's the perfect customer for you and go after them, usually they're going to open so many more doors for you because everybody else will see they're using you and they will follow. And certainly in Silicon Valley, it's lemming country. If one person uses you, that's a high profile business, everybody else starts to look at you. Um, and the other one is, of course, why are you different? You know, because everybody there, Everybody's selling over there, so how can you differentiate yourself? How can you get your message across clearly that you're not the same as everybody else? Um, and also establish your credibility. So, you know, content, blogging, trying to de develop thought leadership, other people using your product, all will build up your credibility and, and allow you to do that quickly. So there's lots of things that, um, you know, you can get wrong, but there's lots of things you learn from it. Um, the other one is to say yes. So. You know, women are slightly different to men when it comes to confidence, right? Does that ring any bells, no? Uh, so with a lot of men, I wish I had even 25% of this, you know, that guy didn't buy my product because he's a moron. I'm brilliant, okay? I, I'm just brilliant. Whereas a female, when she goes in, that guy didn't buy my product, what's wrong with my product, okay? So, you know, don't think like that. Don't worry about things. If you get an opportunity, even if you feel you're not able for it, but it's going to be good for you, just say yes and go and do it, and you'll find you can rise to the challenge. The other thing is that if you have a brilliant product or solution or a service, that is going to accelerate your chance to grow. So if other people love it, if other people use it, then other people will tell other people, and it really speeds up your ability to acquire customers. And the other one is that everybody now, you can try so many things. You guys must do you know, lots of free trials to get access to content or free tools. But if the experience is really, really good, you're also going to build a brand that everybody talks about. 
And so we concentrate a lot on our product development. At the beginning, we just thought, let's get a minimal viable product. And then we met a guy called Joff Redfern from LinkedIn, who was one of the founding team who built LinkedIn. And he said, why would you buy a minimum, build a minimum viable product? Why don't you build a minimum brilliant product? And so we try now everything we do to make it really special, really, really good. And the final part is our challenge. So Brenda and I, I mean, it's, I couldn't do what I'm doing without a co-founder. If you get a chance to run a business with somebody else, it makes such a difference because I've done it on my own and I'd much prefer to do it with somebody else because they have a different perspective than you do. They've got different skills. You need to have somebody to, to lean on when you're, not, when you're having the bad days and you need somebody else to, to push you along when things are going good. But the biggest challenge is finding really good people. Finding good people um, is, is a big challenge. And for us, that's going to be our next challenge. Um, and I think, from my experience, the character of somebody, the ambition to do well, is much more important sometimes than the skills they already have because they can overcome those. So good luck, and I hope that was useful and nice to meet you. <laughs>